Um, so today I'm going to present a case on behalf of my collaborators, uh, Dr. Hannah Gay, who's shown on the left from the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and Dr. Catherine Zuriaga from the University of Massachusetts. And it's, it's important to point out that this is a, a single case and a proof of concept. Uh, Dr. Hannah Gay is, is the pediatric HIV specialist for the, univer for the state of Mississippi. And Dr. Catherine Zuriaga was contacted to assist with the management of this case, where it was recognized that this was an unusual presentation for a perinatally infected child. So just in terms of background and putting this in per perspective, there are um, nearly 70 million individuals who've been infected with HIV over the 30 years of the epidemic. There's still 3.3 uh, million children living with HIV and 330,000 new infections in children each year. But there's only been one case of HIV cure that's been well documented, and that's the uh, well-known case of the Berlin patient. Now, there have been previous reports before highly active antiretroviral therapy was standard of care in the perinatal HIV infection. And these cases um, occurred in the context of before viral load testing was incorporated into clinical care. And a very elegant paper uh, done by uh, Lisa Frankel, where uh, forensic uh, approaches and molecular phylogeny was used to really assess whether uh, clearance of HIV infection occurred in the context of perinatal infection, actually showed that this was not substantiated. Now, with respect to the Berlin patient, HIV cure was accomplished through elimination of replication competent viral reservoirs, and this permitted antiretroviral treatment discontinuation without viremic rebound. As most of you know, the Berlin patient achieved uh, this state of remission due to extensive therapy for his underlying illness with acute myelogenous leukemia, including transplantation with, with stem cells that are resistant to CCR5 uh, HIV infection. And so we've learned several lessons from the Berlin patient. One is that it is possible to uh, completely eliminate replication competent HIV reservoirs from an infected person. And, and second, and importantly, that has uh, relevance for the case that I'm going to present, is that long term virologic control can be achieved in the presence of waning HIV specific immunity, as the Berlin patient has waning HIV specific immunity. And then thirdly, Persistent low-level detection of HIV DNA and RNA in the Berlin patient has so far not signified impending virologic relapse over a five-year follow-up period. And so today what I'm going to present is what we believe is the first uh, well-documented case of functional cure in a 28-month-old perinatally infected child. Now, at the time of uh, writing up this case, the child was 28 months old. She, uh, the child is now two and a half years old. Um, so this was a, a child who was born at uh, 35 weeks gestation uh, by normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. It was uh, uh, to a mom who was not engaged in uh, prenatal care. And so standard of care in the United States is to do a rapid HIV test during labor and delivery for the obvious reason of identifying an HIV-exposed infant so that appropriate antiretroviral prophylaxis can be administered. The rapid test was positive, but no antiretroviral drugs were given as the uh, delivery was quite precipitous. The baby was transferred to the University of Mississippi Medical Center by 30 hours of age, which was the, the tertiary care center for further care. At arrival at the University of Mississippi, two independent blood samples were obtained to assess HIV infection status. This is, is commonly done in the context of perinatal HIV exposure. Now, what is done generally is in a child whose mom has not received antiretroviral therapy, a single HIV nucleic acid test is drawn. And following uh, the results of that test, a repeat test is obtained. What's unique about this case is both, uh, viral, both virologic tests were done within the uh, first 48 hours of life, allowing very rapid confirmation of HIV infection. And the child was started on prophylaxis with three, a three-drug regimen, zidovidine, lamivudine, and navarapine, by 31 hours of age. Now, what's distinct about this case is that the nevarapine dosage that was given was given at a therapeutic dose level with daily dosing twice daily. 
Now, uh, maternal infection was indeed confirmed. Standard um, antibody tests and Western blot were positive. There was uh, detectable viremia in the mother at a plasma viral load of 2,423 copies per mil. Her C the CD4 count was uh, quite uh, normal at 644 cells. And what we do know is that the infection was indeed with uh, HIV, with subtype B, and wild type infection. Now, these are the, the results from uh, the virologic testing done at 30 and 31 hours of age. So again, two independent viral load tests showing both detection of HIV DNA in the peripheral blood of the child, and then HIV RNA detected at approximately 20,000 copies per ml. It's important to point out within um, the United States and globally, this is the standard definition for HIV infection in a perinatally exposed child. In other words, two independent blood samples drawn on separate occasions showing positive detection of viral nucleic acid. This uh, result uh, warrants antiretroviral therapy in all HIV-infected infants and would therefore render this child to a lifetime of antiretroviral therapy. These results were obtained within the first week of life, so the regimen of AZT3TC was continued as a therapeutic regimen and subsequently switched to a PI-based regimen when infection was confirmed to Kaletra-based heart. Now, what I show here now is the, the plasma viral load measurements uh, done sequentially over the time course of antiretroviral therapy, first initially with AZT3TC nevirapine, shown in red, and then followed by uh, switch to AZT3TC wopinavir from a week of age through 18 months of age. And what you see here, as Bob Silcano uh, described earlier this morning, is the typical biphasic decay in plasma viral loads that we see when patients are placed on heart. In other words, there's a first phase decay followed by second slower phase decay, representing uh, infection of different cell populations, acutely infected activated CD4 cells, and longer lived cells such as macrophages. Now, following initiation of antiretroviral therapy, what you see here, and we see this quite commonly in kids starting um, early heart, is that uh, undetectable plasma viral loads are achieved and maintained. Now, what you see here is really uh, the viral load measurements over the time course of antiretroviral therapy in the first 18 months of life with continued sustained suppression of virus replication on the three-drug regimen. At 18 months of age, the child was lost to follow-up and returned to follow-up at 23 months of age, where the caretaker reported discontinuing antiretroviral drugs at 18 months of age. So five months post-antiretroviral treatment discontinuation, the plasma viral load remained undetectable using standard clinical assays. On follow-up visit, because it was quite unbelievable that the viral load was uh, undetectable, with uh, treatment being discontinued five months previously, the uh, pediatric care specialist repeated the viral load. And what you see is uh, there was continued suppression of virus replication despite no receipt of antiretroviral drugs. In addition, standard HIV ELISA testing was negative, and the standard HIV DNA PCR that's used to diagnose HIV infection in infants was also negative. And it was at this point that uh, Dr. Luziuriaga was contacted with respect to whether antiretroviral therapy should be continued in the, or restarted in this child. And, and this is where we begun our investigation for the potential for HIV cure. Now, um, there were um, multiple ultra-sensitive virologic and immunologic assays done on this child as 24 months and 26 months of age to assess the degree of HIV persistence. And what we did is, um, uh, is we used the same assays that were used to assess HIV persistence in the Berlin patient to really assess cure in this patient. But first, what we assessed was the detection of HIV-specific immune responses as um, evidence of at least exposure or infection to HIV, um, HIV antibody responses, uh, cellular immune responses, and HLA typing to match mother-infant pair to be sure that we were not dealing with switched, uh, switched infant syndrome. Immune activation markers were also assessed. 
In addition, we, con we performed a quantitation of HIV proviral uh, burden within uh, total PBMCs and also cells enriched for CD4 cells, as I'll show later, using the sense ultra-sensitive droplet digital PCR. Plasma viremia was assessed using two different assays to um, account for the, pot the potential for primer binding issues that has been seen with a single copy RNA assay. And so two different RNA assays were used. And in addition, we performed quantitative uh, viral outgrowth assays on enriched CD4 positive T cells, the major reservoir for HIV that precludes virus eradication. And so these uh, studies were performed. We also looked for CCR genotyping to assess whether this, was, um, this case occurred because of the Delta 32 mutation. So first I'll show you the um, HIV Western blot testing. Obviously Western blot analysis would not be performed if your ELISA is negative. This, this child had absent uh, HIV antibody by ELISA testing. And what you see in, in the center at two years and 2.2 uh, years of age, two sequential Western blots while the child had been off therapy for eight and 10 months respectively were completely antibody negative compared to maternal antibody testing at the time of uh, 26 months of age um, of the infant. Uh, there was also no detectable HIV specific CD8 uh, T cell responses and also levels of immune activation were normal. This slide summarizes the extensive virologic testing we've done looking for traces of HIV proviral DNA in PBMC fraction, resting CD4 T cell fractions, enriched CD4 T cells and monocyte derived cells. Uh, viremia was present at one copy per ml and there was low level detection of proviral DNA. And uh, furthermore, upon culture of 22 million cells, we're unable to detect infectious virus in this infant. What you see here are the HLA uh, haplotypes of the maternal and infant, and there's clear matching of HLA alleles. And there was also um, CCR uh, Delta 32 was a wild type. In addition, uh, during and, and following heart, there's uh, complete maintenance of uh, normal CD4 T cell levels in this child before and following uh, heart discontinuation. So, so to summarize, we believe this is the first uh, well-documented case of functional cure in an HIV-infected child. This to us suggests that very early antiretroviral therapy in infants may prevent establishment of a latent reservoir and achieve cure in children. And the finding has potential to really transform our current treatment practices in HIV-infected newborns worldwide with the caveat that this can be replicated. Clinical trials of prompt antiretroviral therapy in infants are already have been in development for the past uh, year with respect to achieve to um, generating a cure agenda uh, for pediatric uh, patients. Uh, in the context of our impact network. I want to um, say first, I, I would uh, really like to acknowledge the family of, uh, to really being engaged uh, in the research aspect of this to, with the hope that this will um, further uh, facilitate our research goals towards cure in children. My collaborators, the laboratory collaborators who really gave us the confidence to be able to report uh, this information at a, a scientific meeting uh, like this. Uh, Matt Strain and Doug Richmond for their assistance with the droplet digital PCR approach to detect very low levels of HIV DNA. Taeyuk Chun and Michael Piatak for their contributions to the RNA detection. And then in my laboratory, the two people who really do the work uh, behind generating the samples for testing and the culture assays, Yaoi Chen and Carrie Zimniak. And most importantly, really, the funding agencies that have funded all of these labs for the past 15 years, the NIH, um, NIAID, and the, um, the private foundations, and AMFAR for spearheading or pilot pediatric collaboratory. I do want to make a plug for the uh, poster Late Breaker 179, which shows uh, additional data that very early ther or early therapy in children results in different dynamics of the latent reservoir in, in children. Thank you for your attention.